Okay. So, good afternoon, Sebastiao, and uh, everybody in the room and uh, online. Uh, the members of the PRG Physics Committee has appointed me as committee president, so I will try to fulfill this task as well as possible. Uh, first, uh, let me introduce the committee. Uh, first, the two reviewers of your work, Nicola Cummins, lecturer at the King's College London in England, and uh, Mathieu Magimé-Dos, senior researcher at IDIAP uh, in Switzerland, uh, followed by the external examiner, uh, Isabel Troncoso, full professor at INESC ID at Lisbon in Portugal, and me, uh, Corinne Frodoy, full professor at Avignon University in France. And uh, the internal examiner, Julie Mauclair, assistant professor at University Toulouse 3 Paul Sabatier in France, who is also uh, a uh, co-supervisor of this thesis. And uh, Julien Panquier, assistant professor at University Toulouse 3 Paul Sabatier in France, who is uh, the official supervisor of this work. So, uh, Sebastiao, if you're ready, it's now your turn for a presentation of roughly 45 minutes. So, let's go. Okay, uh, thank you very much to the members of the jury and everyone here uh, gathers for the presentation. Uh, so, I'll be here today uh, to talk about my PhD thesis entitled Deep Learning Approaches to Assess Speech Intelligibility of Head and Neck Cancers. Uh, developed during the past three years here in Toulouse and also on behalf of the TAPAS project uh, an European project that uh, funded the research of 15 individual PhD students uh, scattered across Europe. So now we can start and wait. since we are talking about the topic of speech intelligibility here, it becomes, well, first relevant to define what speech intelligibility is. And according to Ray D. Kent, there's two approaches that we can use to define speech intelligibility. The first one being a subjective assessment performed by clinicians uh, that could take the form of a score on a standardized scale after listening to the patient. And a second approach, uh, namely a perceptual objective measurement, usually obtained through the set of uh, percentage of items that are accurately recognized by a listener. So here we see that we have two uh, definitions that will be a, th a topic that will come with us also uh, towards uh, the end of this presentation. So now that we have a definition of what speech intelligibility is, it becomes relevant to give some motivation on why we want to predict uh, this measure. So why should we predict speech intelligibility? So actually, speech intelligibility is a clinical measure uh, that can be used to assess speech affecting disorders, such as the case of head and neck cancer, the main disorder that we'll be assessing uh, throughout this presentation. It is a measure that's typically assessed perceptually uh, that can be used to track the quality of life and recovery process during post-treatment of these uh, speech affecting disorders. And also, well, by performing a continuous analysis of this measure, uh, we can obtain a quantifiable measure that's suited to evaluate uh, the speech therapies that are implemented uh, during post-treatment and recovery of this type of speech affecting disorders. So now that we have uh, some motivation and the definition of this perceptual measure, it also becomes really re relevant to state the main problems and the main issues associated to this type of measure. So despite being a measure widely used cl clinically, it is a measure that's uh, subjective since the clinicians can have divergent opinions regarding the intelligibility of certain patients. It is a measure that's biased since those same clinicians can be biased on the patient or the speech task at hand that was used to analyze uh, and speech affecting disorders in this case. And well, it's also a variant measure and hard to reproduce since uh, the clinicians can also be conditioned on prior assessments performed uh, in the same day on different patients. So now that we have, well, this broader context of speech intelligibility and the way that it's integrated within, um, within a clinical setting, an automatic approach, we can see that it becomes relevant in the sense that uh, it can tackle some of these issues, the subjectivity, uh, bias, variance, and so on. And in order to define these types of automatic approaches, we can form two big generalized umbrella terms. So the first one, we can see that we can obtain an automatic score based on the amount of recognized speech items uh, by, for example, an automatic speech recognizer. And we can also have also a more general approach of regressing a score based on the usage of relevant speech processing technologies that can either range from meaningful feature extraction to also 
uh, full data-driven approaches. So we see here that we have these two approaches and that they somehow also correlate to the two different measures of speech intelligibility that I introduced in the beginning of this presentation. However, uh, there's also some issues associated with this, uh, these two methods of predicting intelligibility. The first one being that uh, ASR-based systems tend to underperform on patients with severe speech impairments, and those will be the patients that would benefit the most from obtaining a discriminative uh, intelligibility score. And well, also on uh, data-driven approaches, it is known that they uh, lack explainability or normally tend to require extensive amounts of data to operate properly. So this will also be uh, a topic that we will be uh, concentrated on uh, during the course of this thesis. So now uh, we'll introduce the C2SI corpus, the French corpus of NNA cancer, which was the corpus that we were mostly centered on during the development of, uh, of this work. It was a corpus recorded for the purpose of measuring the impact of oral and pharyngeal cavity cancer on speech, on speech production, as well as to assess uh, patient's quality of life after treatment. In terms of uh, some uh, light statistics, the corpus comprises a total of 127 speakers, out of which 87 are patients that suffer varying levels of oral cavity or, or pharyngeal cancer, and also 40 healthy uh, speakers as controls. Uh, it's important to state that all patients in the red cancer treatment. And well, in terms of uh, recorded speech tasks and perceptual evaluations, uh, the recorded speech tasks range from a sustained vowel, reading passage, picture description, spontaneous speech. So normally uh, tasks that are used in the assessment of pathological speech and also the perceptual evaluations, they, despite, well, uh, speech intelligibility being the main measure that we'll be assessing throughout this work, there were also measures such, uh, such as speech disorder severity, prosody, resonance, that also may be relevant uh, for speech intelligibility. So now that uh, I gave an introduction on the corpus, the, um, uh, the problem around speech intelligibility and what speech intelligibility is, it becomes relevant to define the research questions that will be uh, addressed during the course of this work. So the first one will be, uh, since we are making use of deep learning, is whether deep learning can be reliably used to predict speech intelligibility. The second research question will be, how can we build trust in these systems in order for them to be applied uh, clinically? And well, the third, uh, final, and the most relevant research question is, uh, can a granular approach work when predicting speech intelligibility? And if so, what are the added benefits? This will be the most uh, relevant research question tackled uh, during this thesis, and I will uh, introduce this granular approach uh, right away. So why should we use a granular approach, and what is a granular approach in the sense of speech intelligibility? Well, the process of speech recognition can take many shapes, uh, ranging from sentences, words, syllables, or even phonemes in different cases. And here we can start to see these uh, varying levels of granularity of having longer speech units to smaller, most irreductible speech units, such as phonemes. Well, looking at these larger speech units, for example, parameters such as prosody and resonance can play a relevant role uh, in speech intelligibility. And normally these parameter, parameters uh, such as prosody, they are better assessed using longer speech units. Well, going to the other side of the spectrum, a more precise speech analysis uh, at a smaller level, for example, phonemic articulation, can give interesting intelligibility cues that longer speech units simply cannot provide. And well, uh, since we are working with a really complete corpus, we have a variety of different tasks, why should we limit ourselves to a single type of speech assessment or clinical measure? So now that I introduced this granular approach, which, which will be the main topic assessed uh, during the course of this work, uh, I can introduce the three different levels of granularity that will be assessed. So we'll first start with the sentence level intelligibility assessment, then going on to a smaller granularity level by exploring intelligibility at word level. And then finally, we have uh, intelligibility at phoneme level. And the main goal here is to develop these three methods and obtain a measure uh, at each one of the of these levels. And well, since we have to start somewhere, uh, we'll start by uh, the sentence level speech intelligibility system that we developed, and I'll jump on it right away. But before, uh, I'll just also start by giving some motivation of why we uh, want or why we should predict intelligibility at sentence level. So it is the first level of granularity assessed here, as you may see, and generally the most evaluated one. It is also uh, the granularity level that more closely matches spoken communication in terms of length, since normally spoken uh, communication is uh, the means of sentences or longer speech units. 
And also, out of all the three granular levels, it's the one where data can be more easily obtained in the sense that we do not uh, need any prior force alignment to obtain either isolated phonemes or, for example, record specific words for the case or the context of an intelligibility assessment. So now that uh, I gave some motivation on this topic, I will also introduce a very contextualized state of the art that is relevant for the development of the systems that we performed at this granularity level, which is the speaker embedding paradigm. So the first question that my, uh, may appear is what are speaker embeddings? So speaker embeddings are fixed length and low dimensional vectors that represent speaker characteristics from an input signal. And well, these embeddings can either be extracted from universal background models, such as the case of I vectors, or more recently, deep neural networks, such as the case of the X vectors, yes, which yes. we will no, be making use lot. during the course of this granularity level. So yeah, it's really also important to state that despite these embeddings being normally used for speaker verification in automatic speech recognition tasks, they've been applied to a, a variety of other mm -hmm. uh, uh, approaches, such as emotion recognition, pathology detection, uh, and so on. And given this, this wide approach and the uh, variety of applications, we decided to apply them to the specific context of speech intelligibility. And here, uh, I will introduce the X vector extraction system just to give some context on how we can obtain these embeddings. Uh, I'll just give a quick overview on how the system operates. So we have a uh, neutrons, an audio file uh, as input corresponding to a speech audio file. We pass it then through a filter bank extraction that extracts meaningful frequency-based features. And afterwards, we pass it through a set of time-delayed neural networks, as we can see here, that operates at frame level and is able to uh, extract meaningful information from that. Afterwards, we pass it through a statistics pooling layer that aggregates all information. And uh, here we stop working at frame level and we start working at uterans level. And then a set of uh, fully connected layers that's then appended to a softmax. The softmax here was used simply to train the system because obviously the system is trained on speaker verification. However, we will not use the output of the system directly. We will use the affine components extracted from layer six as these uh, low dimensional uh, speaker embeddings, in this case, the dimension of 512. So now I can talk that, that well, I gave some context on these speaker embeddings. I can talk about the system that we developed to uh, predict intelligibility at this granularity level entitled the Sentence XVEC system. I will give some overview on how the system operates. It's fairly streamlined. So we have a waveform uh, as input. We then pass it through the X vector extractor that we uh, previously seen. Uh, and also, well, based on those X vectors, we yeah, train the regressed uh, shallow neural network that is able to, um, uh, that is able to uh, predict these intelligibility measures. Just, I won't go that much into detail on the, the, parameter, uh, the hyperparameters and the architecture parameters used, but, uh, each training file underwent a temporal distortion as data augmentation, 0 0.9 and 1.1, respectively, without changing pitch and spectral envelope. And the system uh, was trained using a five-fold cross-validation scheme, where each fold contained 84 speakers and the uh, remaining 21 at each fold were used for, uh, training, for testing. So now I will introduce the data that from the C2SI corpus, obviously, that we used to, to train this system. So we made use of the passage reading task of the C2SI corpus, which is called the uh, Parole de Monsieur Segan. It is a, a passage test that's widely used and applied in uh, French clinical assessments, and it contains at least one occurrence of every single uh, French phoneme. Uh, for the sake of having a bit more data to work with, uh, we decided to segment the um, uh, the corp, the, this uh, passage reading into eight individual segments of similar length. And as far as the reference perceptual measure that we used to train this shallow ne neural network that I uh, talked before, we used the reference intelligibility measure obtained from picture description uh, that was evaluated by a set of six experts and the values were comprised between zero uh, corresponding to an intelligible speech and 10 corresponding to a perfectly uh, healthy speech. It's important also to state that uh, we were using uh, the intelligibility based on, on picture description, uh, besides having an intelligibility measure that was applied to the passage reading task, but we decided to use this one simply to mitigate the bias associated to the prior knowledge of the speech task uh, being issued. So now that we have some context on the date and also on the system, I can uh, introduce the results uh, that we were able to obtain at this granularity level. So uh, as you've seen before, we used eight individual segments to predict intelligibility and uh, eight intelligibility measures per segment. Uh, we decided to average all of the, these eight individual predictions uh, in order to 
regressed intelligibility score for a single speaker. And we were able to obtain a high base correlation of 81% uh, Spearman's correlation and a root mean square there of uh, around 1.72. We compared this approach to a, a, a previous approach based on the I vectors. Exactly the same training methodology was used. The only difference was that the I vectors were, uh, were slightly smaller in dimension, 400 instead of the 512 of the X vectors. And we can see a correlation gain uh, of almost 10% uh, and an interesting uh, dec a decrement on the error here. Interestingly, since we had eight individual segments, we also went to look in the segments that could be more relevant for speech intelligibility. And we saw that if we only used segment two, uh, we were able to obtain a really high base correlation of 82 instead of using the average of those eight individual segments. And the root mean square there, we can see here, that is also uh, lower than uh, the root mean square there obtained with the averaged approach. We also implemented some uh, a decision tree criteria as post-processing for the sake of time. I won't go that much into detail on this part, but by using this to find a, a better segment choice, we were able to obtain a correlation gain uh, of up to 85 and also a decrement on the error. Interestingly, uh, from looking also at the individual segments, we saw that if we manually chose the best and the worst segments, so for each speaker, if we pick out of the eight segments, the segment that was closest to the reference measure and the segment that was the furthest away, we were able to obtain two different intelligibility values, as you may see here. So the first one, a lower value of 53%, and for the second case, a, a really high intelligibility value of 95%. Uh, and those values were reflected on the air as well, showing us that there's indeed, there are indeed better segments that can convey better intelligibility measures. However, the choice of these optimal segments are not linear. Uh, so what have we learned uh, in terms of conclusions at this granularity level? Well, we start by saying that we can reliably predict speech intelligibility at sentence level using the X-Vector speaker embedding paradigm. We saw that for each speaker, there are sentences that are able to convey a much more precise intelligibility estimation than others. Uh, this is, well, hypothesized to be connected to the phonetic content being issued and specific mispronunciations that some speakers may have. So it's not necessarily a one-fits-all sentence that may be the best for everyone, but different sentences adapted for different speakers. And also, tumor location, reconstruction type may also affect the optimal uh, sentence choice, despite no clear pattern uh, being found uh, in this case. Uh, it's also important to, to state that the work presented at this granularity level was valorized by the following publication that was uh, accepted and presented at Interspeech 2020. So now we can go back to the plot that we saw at the beginning. So uh, as I stated before, we started by the intelligibility assessment at sentence level, and we can start to fill in the blanks in this plot. So we can uh, put in our intelligibility measure obtained at sentence level. And we still, however, have two more systems to cover. And we will be now uh, following this natural line, uh, jump into the word level speech intelligibility system. And well, similarly to the previous, uh, to the previous system, I will start by giving some motivation of, on why we want to predict intelligibility at word level. And well, uh, words can be seen uh, as the middle ground between an assessment on general speech materials, uh, sentences, text, segments, larger speech units, and the highly precise phonetic analysis. Uh, an assessment based on words can tackle specific contextual coarticulations, namely constant, constant coarticulation, constant vowel, and so on. And by tackling those specific coarticulations, it could provide interesting cues that could be connected to speech intelligibility. And well, uh, obviously, an intelligibility measure that is able to link phonetic coarticulations and speech intelligibility can be seen as more interpretable or explainable, which is also uh, an ongoing topic that we'll be covering throughout this presentation. So now that um, I gave some motivation on this topic, I can also present a contextualized uh, state of the art for this part, which was based on uh, attention-based models. So what are attention-based models? They are a class of uh, deep learning systems that help mapping input to output sequences by focusing on more relevant parts of the utrance while ignoring le uh, rest less relevant ones. So uh, really relevant for, um, for mapping sequences. And well, in terms of usages, they, uh, the attention-based models are one of the most groundbreaking ideas in the past few years in deep learning. And uh, while well, they've been applied to a variety of different tasks and more specifically in our context, for example, intelligibility classification in children's reading, uh, disease detection, such as disease and pathology detection, such as dementia, for instance, or even in data augmentation schemes for dysarthric speech. 
So for the sake of simplicity, there's a, a lot of different ways that we can apply these systems, uh, but I'll just give an introduction on the two main types per se. We have the generalized attention that works within input and output elements. So that maps an input sequence to an output sequence by uh, pointing out the most relevant bits. And also uh, the self-attention mechanism, which will be what we'll be making use of. That works only within input elements because here we have an input sequence, an audio file, but we don't have an output sequence. We have an intelligibility score that we want to model. So in terms of the data being used, uh, the data that we used here is, well, uh, different than the one that in the measures are different than the ones that were uh, used in the previous system. And in this case, we made use of the pseudo word task that was also recorded within the context of the C2SI corpus. And here in this case, uh, each speaker was asked to uh, record a set of 52 pseudo words that despite being non-existent in French language, they respect, uh, they respect French phonotactic and orthographic rules. And these words can follow uh, the following structure of having either a single consonant or uh, dual consonants in the beginning, followed by a single vowel, followed by a consonant or another uh, set of two consonants, and then followed by a final vowel. As far as the perceptual measure that was used in this case, it was a measure, an intelligibility measure that was used specifically uh, for the case of uh, pseudo words, in this case, the perceived phonological deviation. Uh, where uh, the pseudo words were transcribed by three naive listeners, and then uh, an alignment was performed between the, the two pseudo words where we have the ground truth and the transcription. And then based on the phonetic distance between the two, we are able to obtain an accumulated distance through a Wagner-Fischer algorithm that then corresponds to the intelligibility measure. So in this case, a larger value corresponds to a larger distance, which, well, uh, corresponds to a lower intelligibility score, contrary to the uh, scores that we've seen previously uh, at the sentence level system. So as far as methodology is concerned, I will introduce now the word RNN system, uh, which was the system that we developed for uh, the intelligibility prediction at this granularity level. I added here a, a plot just to illustrate uh, and give some intuition on how the system behaves. So as an input, we have the isolated pseudo word files, which are then passed through a filter banks extraction that extracts also a relevant uh, frequency based features which are then fed to our gated recurrent unit encoder with the appended self-attention mechanism. Uh, the results, the, the resulting outputs of the self-attention mechanism are fed to a set of fully connected layers, which then pass through a global max pooling that uh, is able to obtain the individual uh, intelligibility scores that correspond to each one of the isolated pseudo words. And since here we have an isolated score for each one of the pseudo words, in order to obtain an intelligibility score uh, for the speaker, we perform the average of these scores uh, and that corresponds exactly to our intelligibility score being used. As far as the, the systems training, uh, we also use the tenfold cross-validation scheme. Uh, I added here some hyperparameters, but I won't go that much into detail. I will say that, uh, well, it's difficult to generalize these systems because it's not an immediate choice of architecture and also of hyperparameter tuning. But uh, uh, luckily, the, the training methodology that we applied was able to uh, showcase interesting results, as we can see here. So from the, the system, the architecture and the, um, the training parameters, we were able to obtain a, a high base correlation of 87% and the root mean square there of, uh, in this case, 0 0.37. It's important to state that uh, these correlation errors are not directly comparable to the previous results because they use a different intelligibility measure, despite the two measures being correlated, obviously. However, we compared it, we adapted the previous system to this particular measure, so uh, it could remain comparable. And we can see that from the X vectors, we are able to obtain a correlation gain of 7% and an error decrement as well, despite being fairly comparable as well. Uh, we also compared this system to a Wagner-Fischer baseline that, well, instead of using the perceptual transcriptions, an automatic speech recognizer was used uh, for, to compute the alignment. And here we can see um, that uh, a big gap in correlation and uh, an error uh, decrement, a reduction on the error of more than 50%. However, uh, here we are using the mean of 52 pseudo words. And obviously the recording of 52 pseudo words is not only also time consuming, but it can be highly exhausting for patients, especially the ones that have lower intelligibility values. That would be the ones that would benefit the most uh, from using this type of systems. And therefore we went, uh, wanted to assess also the reliability of our system when using a smaller amount of data at inference time. So if we can use less pseudo words to obtain still a reliable score. And we performed this pseudo word reduction based on the words that have and that do not have occurrences of double consonant. 
so as I stated before, uh, the words, there was a subset of words, there are subsets of words that have double consonants, uh, as we can see here. And we decided that use these subsets that were uh, recorded the same for, for each speaker uh, to perform this reduction. And uh, when we use, for example, here, as we can see, the 16 words that have double consonants at the beginning, uh, we are able to obtain a, a high correlation of 85% and uh, the root mean square there remained the same. So the correlation remains fairly comparable and the error remains the same. And the same thing was witnessed as well, very similarly or very closely uh, with the subset of pseudo words that have double constant, however, in this case, uh, at the middle. Stating that, well, we can use smaller amounts of data in this case and still obtain a reliable uh, correlation and error values. We also uh, assessed how the 26 pseudo words without double constant would operate. And despite the, the results being fairly high as well, we can see a, a correlation drop as well. And uh, the error starts to increase a little bit as well. Interestingly, we also went to see if we could find the most, uh, the smallest set per se of pseudo words that we can use and still obtain a fairly decent intelligibility measure. And uh, in this case, we also uh, checked for each speaker using the five words that have double constant at the beginning and at the middle. And uh, despite the correlation not being as good as the, the ones previously seen, we are able to still obtain a high correlation of almost 80%, and the error value still remains fairly comparable to the errors uh, seen previously. And it's important to state that these results, despite not being as good, they make use of less than 10% of the original sample size being uh, a big reduction in terms of uh, the amount of pseudo words used uh, at inference time. So no new system was trained in this part. We simply assessed the reliability of these sets. Uh, when predicting intelligibility. So now we can jump out to, to the conclusions at this uh, granularity level. So what have we learned? Uh, we saw that high correlations and low errors can be achieved when using the word RNN system. So the system that we developed uh, to predict speech intelligibility at this granularity level. Uh, we saw that we can significantly reduce the quantity of pseudo words used at inference time uh, to regress the intelligibility score without affecting performance. And uh, the pseudo words were important in this case. And well, similarly to the perceptual case, uh, another work uh, that performed the study on the reliability of using these words with double consonant, however, for the perceptual measure, not for the automatic measures, we can say that in the context of our automatic system, words with double consonant are indeed better indicators of speech intelligibility than words without, which also corroborates the fact, the aspect that was found uh, perceptually. So it's also important to state that the work presented at this granularity level was valorized by the following publication that was accepted and presented at JEP of the present year 2022. So now we can start filling in uh, the blanks again into our general diagram that has been with us since the beginning of this presentation. So we have the sentence XVEC system that operates at sentence level. We have the word RNN system now that operates at word level. And well, obviously there's uh, one missing level, the phoneme intelligibility level that will be exactly uh, the system that we will be focusing on this part of our work now. So similarly to the previous chapters and the, the previous works, uh, I'll start by giving some motivation on why we want to predict intelligibility uh, at phoneme level. So phonemes are the smallest speech units and the foundations of spoken communication. Therefore, an assessment at this level becomes uh, always relevant. Uh, an analysis at phonetic level can be seen as more objective, since it doesn't take in consideration perception-based aspects, for example, prosody that requires larger speech uh, units to be uh, thoroughly assessed. And well, there are different studies in the literature that suggest the relevance of individual phonemes for speech intelligibility, namely consonants. There's not a lot of consensus within the scientific community of whether vowels or consonants are more relevant for speech intelligibility. But here, uh, due to the findings found at sentence level, we decided to go uh, and study more using the consonant similarity paradigm. So now I can introduce the contextual state of the art, uh, which made use of similarity estimation systems, uh, more specifically Siamese networks. So the question that may arise uh, similarly to the previous cases is uh, what are Siamese networks? So these are a class of systems that are used to compute the similarity between uh, two given inputs. This similarity measure can be given by a distance measure from a latent space representation, from an embedding uh, representation that's derived from both inputs. And well, um, I will add a plot uh, to showcase a bit better how these systems operate, but they have been applied also to a variety of different cases, uh, such as sentence similarity, speaker verification, mispronunciation detection. And since we are uh, using smaller speech units, we thought that it would be interesting also to study these systems 
in the specific context of uh, phonetic analysis. So here I added the plot just to illustrate how uh, briefly how this type of systems operate. It will be relevant for the system that we developed. So we have two inputs that pass through, uh, through Siamese networks that normally uh, have the shared weights, out of which we are able to obtain uh, two embedding or vectorial representations. And then based on the distance between these two embeddings, we can obtain uh, a similarity score. So now in terms of methodology, I can introduce the Funime SN system, which was the system that uh, we developed at this uh, intelligibility level uh, to, to predict speech intelligibility. Um, I added here, uh, similarly to the word RNN system, I will showcase how the system works briefly by covering uh, the different uh, building blocks. So we made use of uh, individual phonemes obtained through forced alignment, so uh, from the pseudo task. And uh, we can see here that we extract meaningful features, in this case, 13 MFCCs uh, that are then fed to uh, these two bidirectional gated recurrent unit encoders that have shared weights, out of which we are able to obtain uh, two embedding representations. Afterwards, we compute the absolute difference uh, between these two embedding representations. The resulting vector is then passed through a fully connected block, a DNN block, which then uh, is fed to a sigmoid that uh, comprises the values between zero and one, where values closer to zero, uh, it means that uh, the two inputs are less similar, while values closer to one uh, means that the, the two inputs are uh, more similar. And this will be our phonetic similarity score that we will be making use uh, to um, uh, regress our intelligibility measure. So in terms of system training, uh, as I stated before, here we'll be concentrated on uh, using uh, consonants, more specifically consonant similarity. And so we created 16 different models, uh, one for each French consonant. So we used uh, same phoneme pairs in order to mimic healthy uh, phonemes while different phoneme pairs mimic pathological uh, phonemes. So uh, in order to train a similar pair, we feed, for example, a phoneme P with other occurrences of the phoneme P, so they would be closer in the embedding space. While uh, phoneme, for example, P uh, with a phoneme T or a phoneme F, uh, those would be uh, further away in the embedding space. And then uh, based on the amount of similar or, simi or dissimilar uh, phonemes that we may encounter for a given speaker, we are able to regress an intelligibility score that I will present them in the function that we used. And in order to train the system, we made use of the forced aligned uh, phonemes from the 24 uh, controls. So now in terms of results, uh, the system was tested, uh, was trained on the controls and was tested on the remaining patients of the C2SI corpus. Uh, in order to test each new phone, uh, we pair them with all of the reference training phones in during training, meaning that if we have a phoneme uh, P, for instance, it was paired with all the phoneme P's that were seen during training. And this new uh, test phoneme is considered similar if it's similar to the majority of those phones seen during training or dissimilar otherwise. And then uh, based on that amount of similar or dissimilar phonemes, so we made use of uh, this uh, function here in order to regress the intelligibility score. That's a direct function of the amount of uh, similar, similar phonemes of a given, uh, of a given class uh, divided by the total occurrences of those uh, same uh, phonemes for a given, uh, given speaker. So in terms of results, uh, we can see here that we obtain um, a high correlation of 82%. However, the root mean square there in this case, it's comparable to the one seen during sentence and it's a larger error. Um, however, it's important to state that in this case, we did not make use of the reference intelligibility measures in order uh, to train the system. So the system can be seen as more objective since we use the phonetic similarity paradigm in this sense. However, uh, this value of the error was still puzzling, uh, puzzling us a bit. Uh, since we have a, a, an interesting high base correlation. So we saw that there was this uh, set of outliers here that the system was not uh, predicting intelligibility using the present function um, as accurately as possible. So we went to look uh, what was happening with this set of patients here. Uh, and as a post-processing, we saw that uh, by uh, perceptually listening to these patients, uh, we saw two big groups, uh, for example, patients that had a hoarse or very brief voice quality with phonation issues, and also patients with uh, highly nasalized uh, plosive overcompensation. So meaning that in the plosive group, uh, they were uh, overcompensating nasally, for example, instead of saying peu, they were saying pon, uh, which despite being uh, intelligible and understandable in the sense, since the system did not see any of those funds during training, obviously uh, it was underperforming. 
And well, we saw that if we took those patients and uh, suppress from the score certain constants, so instead of using the 16 constants for those patients, if we took the plosives out of the equation, or for example, the voice constant, voiced constants out of the equation, a better intelligibility prediction was typically obtained. And uh, well, we went in the literature to see if we could find meaningful features that could model those patients. And we found a set of three features here from the edgy maps that correlated well to findings in the literature and this type of uh, mispronunciations and well uh, by suppressing uh, those phonemes accordingly uh, using uh, empirically tuned thresholds we were able to obtain a correlation gain uh, in this case up to uh, 89 uh, percent from 82 to 89 by conjugating these different aspects which can be seen as an interesting correlation gain that still maintains uh, this layer of interpretability in the system so as far as conclusions are concerned at this granularity level so what have we learned uh, well, we saw that we can achieve high correlations when predicting speech intelligibility at phoneme level using the phoneme SN system, so the system that we developed at this level. Uh, we saw that the constant similarity paradigm showed that we can obtain an automatic intelligibility measure without using the perceptual intelligibility measures during training, so without making use of these uh, measures during training and still finding a way that correlates well, that can be seen as more objective with these measures. Uh, also, the resulting score can be seen as more interpretable since it can be traced down to the amount of similar or dissimilar phones the speaker has. So out of the three systems can be seen as the most interpretable one. And well, uh, we saw that also depending on the speaker and speech impairment uh, experience, there are phonemes that are more relevant for speech intelligibility than others, as we saw that by suppressing those phonemes that were being misarticulated, we were able to obtain a better score. And this aspect also corroborates the findings that were found at the first level of granularity that showed that there are sentences better at conveying intelligibility for some speakers uh, than others. It also becomes uh, interesting to state that the work presented at this granularity level was valorized by the following publication that was uh, accepted and presented at Interspeech of uh, the present year. So now we are uh, getting closer to the end and uh, we see that we have here our three systems that target these three different levels of granularity and uh, as an output of each one of these systems we're able to obtain uh, three uh, intelligibility measures that operate at these different levels of granularity so a logical step to go a bit further and see what would happen uh, afterwards as a global measure we decided to see what would happen if we were able to mix these three different intelligibility measures into obtaining a single uh, general measure. And uh, well, uh, we call this part as a general model, uh, curiosity to see how the, the systems would behave. And I'll start by giving some motivation on why using this general score or general model uh, could be interesting. So we saw that from the three previous granular systems studied, uh, different conclusions and insights were uh, obtained. And also that each system had different types of shortcomings and also different sets of outliers. So obviously the idea of aggregating the different scores into a single general intelligibility score becomes highly appealing since this aspect could also uh, help us mitigate the individual shortcomings of each granular model, as well as also to promote a better or more uh, precise intelligibility score. So in terms of methodology and results, we uh, made use of simple statistical operators such as mean, max, uh, mean, median, and so on. Uh, simply for the sake of simplicity and also interpretability. Obviously, we could train a, another system that could show us the best one, but some interpretability would be lost. And given this, uh, from these statistical operators, we saw that, for example, in the case of averaging the, um, the results of the three different systems, we were able to obtain a, a high base correlation of 91% and the root mean square there of 1.59, as we can see here. So as far as the statistical operator studied, uh, the mean and the weighted mean in the sense, however, with the fine-tuned weights, uh, we're able to obtain the better scores. And we can see here that uh, two really high uh, correlations were achieved. However, we compared these results to an Oracle approach that uh, manually shows us the best uh, score for each speaker, similar to what we saw uh, in the sentences. And we see that despite uh, we, uh, the mean and weighted mean being really close to the ceiling, so to the maximum possible correlation of 92% in this case, uh, as far as the area is concerned, there's still a narrow gap here uh, to be addressed that, as we can see here in the set of outliers, this is from the mean, uh, it's mostly associated to low intelligibility patients, so an underrepresented class uh, in the corpus that, well, since the two first systems were making use of 
uh, the perceptual measures as referenced during training, uh, obviously the system will not be uh, as accurate in these uh, patients as it could be. So in terms of uh, conclusions at this uh, aggregating general level, uh, what have we learned? We saw that despite some correlation uh, fluctuations in the error reductions, the merging approaches showed clear correlation gains. Um, while the correlation was near the maximum possible value, uh, as seen by the Oracle of 92%, we saw that there is still room for improvement on the root mean squared error. And well, uh, interestingly, from looking at, at the, the, how the different systems would behave for the different sets of patients, we saw that the Funim SN system was the system that worked the best for the underrepresented class of patients with low reference intelligibility scores. So the ones that uh, were more closely, uh, the system that promoted the scores uh, closest to the target. So now uh, we're getting close, uh, closer to, to the end of this presentation. Uh, I will uh, draw some conclusions on the work that we performed uh, from these uh, systems that I introduced and developed. And in order to better present the, the conclusions, I will pair the conclusions with the research questions that were um, stated at the beginning of, uh, of this presentation. So as you may remember, the first research question was, uh, can deep learning be reliably used uh, to predict speech intelligibility? And the main issue associated to this research question was that deep learning uh, normally tends to require larger amounts of data to operate properly. And in terms of solutions proposed uh, to address this research question, uh, we saw that the methodologies uh, used at the three distant uh, granular levels promoted good correlation values and low errors, showing some reliability of uh, deep learning when addressing uh, to this topic of speech intelligibility. Uh, the usage of data augmentation schemes in pre-trained models, such was the case of the X-vector extractor and the, uh, the data augmentation scheme devised at sentence level, uh, greatly contributed to tackle the issue around smaller quantities of data, an ongoing issue when addressing pathological speech, simply due to the amounts of data there, are, uh, there is not uh, a lot. And we saw also that by uh, creating different ways to regress an intelligibility score, uh, it also showcased the reliability of using these type of algorithms if we decide to approach the problem in a different way, instead of using directly the reference measures, uh, as we saw uh, at FUNIM level uh, with the consonant similarity paradigm that we developed. So the second research question was, how can we build trust in these systems for them to be used uh, clinically? And well, the main issue around this question was that deep learning tends to lack score interpretability. So having a bit of a, a black box paradigm, obviously there's a lot of research also on interpretability uh, of these networks. However, for them to be used cleaning, uh, clinically, uh, some layer of explainability is also, uh, should be required. And it's uh, also a must that could provide contextual information. And in terms of uh, solutions proposed, uh, we saw that by using uh, the mean prediction of uh, either smaller units, for example, the segments that we use at sentence level and the individual pseudo words that uh, we use at word level uh, added uh, an extra layer of context. So instead of having a system that predicts directly the score, we have the system that predicts the individual score for these different units. And then by averaging them, we can have uh, our final intelligibility score. That clinically can provide some information on either specific words that are being misarticulated or sentences that are uh, better or worse for some speakers and so on. And also in terms of interpretability, the constant similarity paradigm at phoneme level uh, illustrated a method to regress an intelligibility score solely based on the amount of similar dissimilar phones that can be seen uh, in this case as uh, highly interpretable because we can trace it back to the amount of uh, similar or dissimilar phones in this case. So the third and final research question, which was the main research question that was addressed uh, during the course of this presentation uh, was whether a granular approach could work uh, when predicting speech intelligibility. And if so, what are the added benefits of uh, this approach? The main issue associated with this research question was that it was previously unseen in the literature and that it required the development of several different automatic models, which was uh, the work that we performed uh, during the course of this thesis. And well, in terms of solutions, uh, we saw that the different granular models displayed interesting results comparable to uh, previous baseline, uh, baseline systems, not only showcasing the reliability of deep learning but also the reliability of this granular approach. Uh, we saw that these models were able to tackle different aspects of speech intelligibility and that the combined usage was able to compensate the shortcomings of the individual, sense, uh, the individual systems. And in this case, we can say that the unified methods displayed uh, correlation gains and uh, uh, error reductions. Uh, hence, we can state that in this context, the total is indeed better than the sum uh, of its parts.
So now uh, we're getting really close to the end. I'll just wrap it up with some perspectives on our work and also on the future possible directions uh, that this line of research can follow. So uh, I will group the perspectives into three different parts. So we have short-term, medium-term, and long-term perspectives. And as far as short-term perspectives are concerned, uh, in this group, um, I put uh, new technologies and methodologies that could be applied either to increase the performance of the developed systems or also to find uh, new interesting ways to predict species eligibility. Uh, for example, new data augmentation schemes using uh, generative models or using key phonetic distortions could be interesting uh, in this sense. Or uh, more recently, using uh, fully end-to-end -end models such as what to vec 2.0, uh, self-supervised or unsupervised uh, methods uh, to, uh, to regress an intelligibility score, despite interpretability still being an ongoing uh, issue uh, with these type of models. As far as medium-term perspectives, uh, here um, I group the clinical integration of the developed systems. There's already been some works in the team that uh, uh, presented some algorithms with interesting results uh, on this topic. And also in this sense, uh, a study that was also performed within the context of this thesis, but uh, for the sake of time, I won't have time to present it here today, which centered around the automatic modeling of perceptual judges. That also touches a bit on the clinical integration of the developed systems, uh, saying the statistical or the practical implications of using an extra automatic judge when performing these clinical assessments, and the question of whether can we replace a perceptual judge uh, by an automatic one and what would come out of it. So getting to the long-term perspectives, uh, these perspectives touch a bit more the touch of spe uh, the, the speech intelligibility uh, as a whole. So not only the automatic part and the perceptual part, but if what would happen if we were able to create a global intelligibility measure that holds up well uh, automatically and perceptually in a clinical set uh, setting, uh, can this measure be less subjective and easier to interpret? We saw that, well, there's a lot of different measures that despite targeting different aspects of um, uh, speech communication disorders. And so uh, despite being highly correlated, they address different topics. What would happen if we merge all of these measures into one a single, for example, uh, pathology uh, associated to speech uh, score? Would it have any clinical uh, validity? Would it be useful? What would happen? So it's a more of a thought provoking question uh, in the broad sense of uh, speech intelligibility. So that will be it for my presentation. Uh, thank you all very much for listening to it. And uh, I'm well open to any questions that uh, the jury may have. Thank you very much. So thank you.